Hey everybody, welcome to Worship with Our Savior Lutheran Church in Thomaston, Connecticut, a congregation of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. My name is Pastor Rachel Anderson and I am so excited to worship with you today because today we are talking about being called. Who are we called to be? What are we called to be? How are we called to be? Stick around and we'll find out together. Now, let's pray. O oh God, with all your faithful followers of every age, we praise you, the rock of our life. Be our strong foundation and form us into the body of your Son, that we may gladly minister to all the world, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Be transformed by the renewing of your minds, 
so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you want to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness, the word of the Lord. of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of the Lord. Who is God calling you to be? For your neighbor, for your community, for our shared world? As Christians, we live in this tension, pulled between the world as it is and the world as it could be. We call the world as it could be the kingdom of God, which is the world the way God intended it to be, just, peaceful, equitable, and overflowing with love. We know God has abundantly blessed us with the ability to listen and understand, and the ability to love one another. We know God has abundantly blessed the whole world because when we share the gifts God has first gifted us, then there is more than enough to go around. And yet, our human brokenness divides us, and our sinful fixation with power, wealth, and comfort exposes us to spiritual death and exposes our neighbor to actual death, to poverty, hunger, and violence. So, my question for you today is, as a follower of Jesus, who is God calling you to be? I want to begin by reading 
a few verses from the first chapter of Exodus. Now a new king arose over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase. And in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pidim and Ramesses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, God gave them families. So this text picks up several generations after Joseph, Joseph and his dreams, Joseph who saved the people of Egypt. There's a new Pharaoh in town and he doesn't remember how the Israelites saved the Egyptians. And more than just ignoring this history, this new Pharaoh is afraid of the Israelites. And as we well know, fear makes people do wacky things. Look, the Israelite people are more numerous than we are. They're more powerful than us. Let's deal with them or they will increase. And then maybe let's say there's a war and then they'll join our enemies and they'll fight against us. This is a classic example of scapegoating. Pharaoh has created an enemy within. He's trying to stir up fear of the foreigner, the immigrant, the other. So he devises this truly horrible plan to enslave the Israelites. And eventually, he even attempts to eliminate this dangerous enemy by committing genocide against them. And he does this in a particularly cruel and horrific way by enlisting the aid of Hebrew midwives to kill all the newborn baby boys of the Israelite people. But before we get to Shipra and Pua, let's jump back to Pharaoh's original statement. He says the Israelite people are more powerful than us. Power. That is what this is all about. The Egyptians feel that the Israelites are a threat to their power. So they try to kill them physically, emotionally, and spiritually. But wouldn't you know that God is in control? And the power of God looks nothing like the power of this world, the powers of 
pharaohs and kings and politicians. In fact, the power of God resists the so-called powers of this world, the powers that seek to divide members of our communities from one another by arbitrary identifiers like the color of your skin, the language that you speak, the way that you vote, the way that you worship. The power of God resists the worldly powers that attempt to seduce us with wealth and comfort. The power of God resists the worldly powers that promise us safety if we only submit. In this case, God's resistance against the powers of this world comes in the form of two midwives, women, Israelites, slaves, two people with absolutely no earthly power. And yet, they refuse to submit to Pharaoh. They will not assist Pharaoh in his genocidal quest against this people. And so the dynamic of a, a king with worldly power and these two women with no worldly power, this dynamic is turned on its head. A king who demands killing and death is suddenly less powerful than two women, two midwives, two slaves, whose job it is to guide new life into the world. And because they resist, God rewards Shipra and Pua, not with worldly power, not with status or wealth or even safety. God rewards them with family. God rewards them with life, with people to love and care for, people who love them and care for them. God rewards these two women with community. When we play by the arbitrary rules of this world, we might be rewarded with stuff, with wealth or with power or with comfort. We might be, or we might not be. But when we listen to God's call on our lives, when you answer the call to love and serve your neighbor, to be the hands and feet of Jesus in and for the sake of the world, then the gift of community, the gift of purposeful lives, the gift of the kingdom of God is your reward. As followers of Jesus Christ, it is our calling to proclaim the truth that the power of God looks nothing like the power of this world. The power of God does not look like fear and intimidation. It looks like defying Pharaoh and saving the children of Israel from genocide. The power of God does not look like hiding and denying. It looks like boldly proclaiming that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the God who calls us to reveal a better kingdom, the God who works through you to restore love and life to this broken and hurting world. The power of God looks like acknowledging that this is a sinful, occasionally painful, sometimes broken world. But indeed, there is nothing new under the sun. But we have God's gift of community and our God-given calling to live and proclaim God's love. As Christians, we cling to our faith that even the gates of Hades will not prevail against God's love. You, my friend, you are called. We are called to be together, even when we can't be 
within six feet of each other. We are called to bear one another's burdens, to care for each other, to share what God has first gifted us with our neighbors for the revelation of God's kingdom. Fear and power and wealth and comfort, these worldly things will always try to lure us away from our kingdom goal. And so we must fix in our hearts the truth that God is calling us to cling to the rock of our faith, even when we're frightened or tempted to let go, in good times and in trying times, we are called to live lives for each other, to love one another, and to get to the work of revealing God's kingdom, which is happening right here and right now. Amen. Let us pray. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Lord, our rock, you are our foundation in Jesus Christ, your Son, whom we confess as the living God. Prepare your church for its mission in bearing witness to Christ, both here at home and throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You call forth praises from the far reaches of the universe to the smallest of creatures. Join our songs to theirs, that a spirit of praise and thanksgiving will arouse us to cherish this wondrous home you have given us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord. Direct the leaders of countries, legislators, and magistrates, mayors, and councils to walk in your ways. Help leaders regard those in need with mercy and fulfill your loving purpose in the governance of peoples. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Though we walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve us, deliver us, 
and fulfill your purpose for us. According to your steadfast love, grant healing and wholeness to those who are bereaved, in trouble or adversity, or sick and in need of care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You call us into this community, our Savior Lutheran Church in Thomaston, in which we, though many, are one in Christ. May we recognize in ourselves and in one another the unique gifts you have given us for the building up of the church for the sake of the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Today we pray for the families and friends of all who have died over these last six months, that they would know the peace and comfort of Jesus. We pray for healing and wholeness for those who are sick and suffering, especially Mackenzie, Lynn, Jenny, Isabel, Margaret, Kent, and Father Jim. We pray for safety for all who work directly with the public, especially frontline workers and first responders and those we now name aloud or silently. Jamie, Molly, Rachel, Maggie, Joe, Gretchen, Amber, Allison, Melanie, Christine, Alex, Andrew, Ann, Monica, Kate, Mike, and Natalie. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You are the everlasting rock from which we were hewn, and you restore your people to joy and gladness. In blessed memory and hope, we thank you for the lives of our beloved dead. Bring us with them to our heavenly home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the sure and certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. At this time, you are invited to make your offering to God. Although we can't be together in person, the work of the body of Christ continues. This work includes feeding our neighbors, binding up the brokenhearted, modeling justice, mercy, and grace. Thank you for your support of this vital, life-giving work. And let us pray. Merciful God, our ordinary gifts seem small for such a celebration but you make of them in abundance, just as you do with our lives. Strengthen us for service in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Friends, I want to thank you so much for worshiping with us here at Our Savior today. Keep taking good care of each other, and always remember that you and all of your neighbors are loved by God, and God calls us to love one another too. And now, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else, in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God, the Creator, Jesus, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God. <laughs>